Victor said a moment ago, our lesson tonight is going to be out of Proverbs chapter 7, and I need you to get your Bible and turn to that chapter, Proverbs chapter 7. It's in the Old Testament. And while you're turning there, and we're going to go through every verse of it in just a moment, I want to mention something about uh, what I've had as an impression of Brother Victor. Back in the 80s, I was in the 30s-something category, and I would read about this brother writing articles, Victor M. Eskew. And I like that. I read those. Boy, that is, I, I like that. It, Never met him, never talked to him. I just saw the name. I'd read those articles, good, powerful, solid lessons. And I had an impression that he was an old man. I mean, like 70 at the time, 75. I, I don't know why I had an impression. He, he wrote like an old man. And... I met him then for the first time in Mississippi. We were on a lectureship together, ended up rooming that week in that lectureship together, and I met him for the first time, and I was shocked. I'm older than he is. I know I don't look it, but, I, but we had a good, good time together that week, and we've been great friends ever since. I appreciate his... Uh, vigor and interest and uh, energy uh, to present the gospel and one of those uh, that we may envy in a good way uh, impressed by his power of knowledge and recall I'm not that way I'm just an old country boy heard a, an older preacher say one time that he was a <laughs> speaking of himself that he was a well noted speaker well, I tend to go that way as well. I'm a well-noted speaker. <laughs> and uh, I admire Brother Victor being able to remember all of those things. I, I do good to read them, let alone remember them all. But we're going to go through our lesson tonight in looking at Proverbs chapter 7. But we want to set the stage and begin in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. The Apostle John was given the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write in this passage, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. God's will is through the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle John in writing the Bible that his children, that we not sin. We ought to work to that end. We ought to study to that end. We ought to pray to that end that we not sin. But yet, being human and in the flesh, we know we sin. All have sinned, come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And so we're going to sin. But we need to also understand that we have an advocate, a go-between, between God and us, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he's given himself for the propitiation for our sin. That, the word sacrifice was the appeasement of God's wrath, his justice. He satisfied through his own redeeming blood, being the sinless, harmless Son of God, to pay the debt for our sins. That's amazing how that God's magnificent love prompted his grace to bestow upon us loving kindness in satisfying his justice through the blood of his own Son, Jesus Christ. So it's God's will that we do the best that we can not to sin. But he tells us being human, we're going to in spite of everything. Pray it's not deliberate. Pray it's not willing. In spite of all of our efforts, we're not perfect. We have, don't have perfect knowledge and perfect anything as far as that goes. And so we're going to sin. But we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. 
We read here in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 20 and 21 likewise that those who sin after having become a Christian deliberately go back into that. He said they're worse off now than had they never known the word of the truth of the gospel than to have known it, obeyed it, and then fall from it. So it's a serious matter to sin. No one ought to ever get the impression or the idea that now we're a Christian, so we have a license to sin. That the blood will cover it. That God's grace is sufficient and it'll take care of it. Though His blood is precious and it washes away our sins. Revelation 1 and verse 5. But it's not a deliberate sin. Not one we go into with our eyes wide open. But those sins in spite of ourselves. So the Lord's will is that we not sin. Paul, as great as he was, a great apostle, had written to the congregation of the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 27, and we mentioned this earlier, and you studied it all your life, that he said, I have to keep watch over my own soul, the paraphrase of it. I, have, I, I keep watch. I, I'm, I'm working busy always about my own self, lest... I also become a castaway. 1 Peter 5, 8, the devil is trying his best to get us to sin as a roaring lion stalking up and down the earth seeking whom he may devour. But you know, the devil is powerless to make me sin if I don't want to. I will be drawn away as you would in any other human being of our own lust. We've talked about that passage over and over this week. James chapter 1, verse 13, 14, and 15. Every man is tempted when drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And we yield to that sin. We give way to that temptation. That's when we sin. So we have a vested interest, and we ought to have, and we labor and work. We need every tool at our disposal for our own soul salvation to be careful and be protected and that we not sin. And we need to know everything that we can know to keep from doing that. And that's what tonight's lesson then is about. We read that Solomon, the wise man, the son of David, the third king of Israel, was a man that could say in our vernacular today, I've been there and I've done that. He had everything. He'd experienced everything. He had all his heart's desires, his eyes even dreamed about. He said, I've tried it all. And he said it nearing the end of his life. What's the conclusion of the whole matter? He said, fear God and keep his commandments for that is the whole of man. That is our whole purpose. So Solomon, being the wise man he is, setting the stage now for Proverbs chapter 7. You're thundering, when are you ever going to get around to that? We're there. Solomon now, the wise man, experienced in sin. He knew about every type of temptation available. And he is, though he's looking at a young man and observing the mistakes of the foolish choices this young man makes. Solomon sitting back there, I know what I'm talking about, young man. I've been where you are. I've done what you're about to do. You're looking like you're going to be doing. I'm trying to warn you ahead of time. So here where we're going to be looking at in this case, in Proverbs chapter 7, we're going to read beginning in verse 1 and reading through verse 5. One of the lessons that we need to learn and know how to not yield to sin. And here is how that is done. Number one, make God's word the rule of our life. The controlling factor of our life. And we get disassociated, disconnected from the Word, the Almighty Word of God, then we are open prey for the devil and all his cohorts. The Bible, the Word of God, 
We make that the rule in our life. Here's what Solomon tells this young man. Verse 1. My son, keep my words. Lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them. Them what? The words, the scripture, the commandments. My law, bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart, say unto them, verse 4, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. Verse 5, regarding the word of God, that they, the words of God, may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her Lips. We're about to read about a woman here shortly in, in the following verses that is going to be tempting this young man to sin with her. So Solomon sees it. And he's warning this young man, young man, you keep God's word. Now every time we read about the word of God, we think about the commandments of God, the testimony of God, the statutes of God, the law of God, any number of words, all referring to the same thing, the law of God, the book of God, that we keep this word, that we might not sin. That's the goal here. That's the purpose. It's going to help keep us out of sin. And we will be kept out of sin if we'll do what it says. And the only way we sin is when we violate what it says. 1 John 3 and verse 4, sin is a transgression of the law. Romans 4, there is no sin where there is no law. God has a law. And we violate that law even a little bit, even one time we sin. So he says we keep the law. Stay out of sin by keeping the law. We've got to remember that. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15 and 16, we read this, Love not the world. Don't love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, any woman love the world, that be the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of God the Father, but is of the world. This old world passes away. Don't love the things of this world. Three major categories in which we all sin. We're all in the same boat in this category. The works of the flesh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every single sin we commit, wherein we're tempted to commit, is going to fall into one of those three categories. And that's what he says here. Think about the Lord. In Matthew chapter 3, the closing verses, the Lord was baptized. Chapter 4 beginning, the first thing you read is that the devil taketh the Lord out into a desert place alone, and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Afterward, he was hungry. Now comes along the devil. The old tempter, Satan himself. After 40 days of no food, the devil says, trying to cast doubt about the deity of our Lord. If thou be the Son of God. The devil knew he was the son of God. He didn't have doubt that at all. He knew exactly, but he was casting doubt. If thou be the son of God, command these stones to be made bread. There's the lust of the flesh. When we read in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. I'll get it right here in a minute. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says about our Lord that he was tempted in all points like as we are. Every single category. You mean the Lord was tempted with crack cocaine? Methamphetamine? Not particularly. Those are manufactured, chemically produced, manipulated drugs. Not particularly. But Hebrews 4, 15 says he was tempted in all points. That means in all categories, all areas, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Drugs fit in the category of the lust of the flesh. 
So yes, the Lord knows what we're dealing with if we're tempted with these hardcore drugs and all the new chemicals and things that are existing in the world today by category. We're all tempted just like the Lord was. But when the devil said, if you be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread, that was a lust of the flesh. The Lord was tempted to turn those stones into bread to satisfy his hunger. But what did the Lord say? How did he resist that temptation to do that? It is written. What does that mean? He remembered the word of God. He not only remembered the word, he kept the word. Now when we're tempted through the lust of the flesh, we may remember the word of God. And the word of God says, don't go there, don't do that, don't get involved in that. We might remember it, but we go ahead and do it anyway. It's no good to remember it if we're not going to keep it. The Lord not only remembered it, he kept it. He said, it is written. He remembered the word of God. That was the first temptation, lust of the flesh. After he resisted that temptation, did not yield to it, then the Bible says in Matthew 4 that he take him into the holy city and upon a high part of the pinnacle of the temple and said, cast thyself down, for it is written. Now the devil gets into quoting scripture. You know the devil knows scripture. He knows it all. He can quote it. And he says, the devil said, for it's written that the angel shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He misapplied the scriptures. The Lord had an appeal there to the vain glory of the pride of life. You ever seen in the news today, somebody's up on a bridge about to jump off. Commit suicide. Up on a high building. They're about to jump off. While the news media all gets there and they look at it and they focus it, that brings everybody's attention. The crowd formed. Everybody's looking to see what would happen. What would that have been about the Lord going up to that pinnacle? If he had jumped off, it wasn't his time to die. Wasn't his time to die, and it wasn't the manner with which the Bible had prophesied that he would die. So he wouldn't have died. No, that part is true. The angels bear thee up, lest any time they dash thy foot against a stone. But he resisted the temptation, the pride of life. He would have jumped off. He wouldn't have died. He could have walked around. Look at me. What other human being could have accomplished such a feat without splattering and be dead? Pride of life. He suffered with that. You know what he did? You know how he resisted that temptation? He said, it is written. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. The devil used the scripture, but he misapplied it, misinterpreted it, and the Lord straightened him out, using a scripture to answer another scripture with a misapplication of that scripture. It is written. How did the Lord resist the temptation? He remembered. He kept the word. How do we resist the temptation of the pride of life? There are people today that think they're something, and they think they're somebody. And they want to be the rulers. They want to be the conqueror. They want to be strutting around like an old peacock hen or something. They're banny rooster. Y'all have banny roosters down here? And that appeals to people. Oh, they want their name and highlights. They want... I heard about a preacher, or actually read his own words that said many, many years ago that his goal in life, he wanted to preach for the largest church of Christ congregation in the whole brotherhood. That was discouraging to me. I thought, what in the word is that better than preaching at, o at Oceanside? Is that better than preaching in a two or three gathered together in a little grass hut somewhere or out under a tree? Somehow or another. Is that is it more prestigious? What, what is it? It was appealing to his pride. I don't want to be the man that preaches with the biggest church in the brotherhood. If we have opportunity to do that, then yes, preach the word. We have an opportunity to preach to one or two, preach the word. So the Lord resisted the temptation by remembering the scripture and he kept that scripture. Then the Bible says that Lord, the devil took him out into exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, if you'll fall down and worship me, all of these things that I will give you. There's the lust of the eyes. Seeing all the kingdoms of the world, the lust of the eyes. What did the Lord say? 
Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. He remembered the Bible. He remembered the scripture, and he kept those scriptures. How do we resist temptation? Rule number one in Proverbs chapter 7, he was telling this young man, remember, remember the word, remember the testimony, remember the law, remember the statutes, keep the word of God. Don't violate the word of God. That's what was the point that was happening. Colossians 3 and verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In Psalm 19, verse 7 through 11, the law of the Lord is perfect, the converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever the judgments of the Lord. Look at all these words talking about the word of God. How perfect, how great, and how stupendous they are. More to be desired than gold. Yea, much fine gold. Sweeter even than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, the word of God is thy servant warned. And by the keeping of them, there is great reward. How did the Lord resist the temptation? Through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He remembered the word of God and he kept it. That's the same way we do it as well. Acts 17, 11, those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They searched the scriptures. 2 Timothy 2, 15, study to show thyself approved unto God. Uh, Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might, I might not sin. How do we keep from sinning? Remember the word of God and keep it in our heart. That's how we do it. That was the advice of this young man. And that was the Lord's example. Even Adam and Eve were there in the same situation. Remember Eve in uh, Genesis chapter 3? God tells the Adam and Eve, you can eat of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the Bible says in Genesis 3 and verse 6, when she saw that the tree was good for food, there's the lust of the flesh. She saw that the fruit was desired to make one wise. There's the pride of life. And she saw that it was a tree pleasant to the eyes, the fruit thereof, the lust of the eyes. She was tempted the same way the Lord was. We're tempted the same way the Lord was, through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. All right, let's go to uh, number two. Pick up here in verse six, Proverbs 7 and verse 6. Read through verse 17. Now here's Solomon. He's telling this young man, Keep the word. Don't go where this woman is. Notice what we read. For at the window of my house, I looked through my casement, and behold, among the simple ones, I discerned among the youth a young man void of understanding. Verse 8, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Verse 12, now is she without, now in the streets and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. Verse 16. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. What lesson do we learn here in this case? It's the lesson to remember the danger of flirting with sin. This young man knew what street that was. 
There are streets in a lot of cities, if not every city, communities, places, that are known for this kind of behavior to be going on. This young man knew that. And yet, verse 8 says, he made the choice to go down that street. Did he not know what was down that street? You better believe he did. And he went down that street anyway. He flirted. He probably thought, from all indication of what's stated here, he didn't really have any intent of stopping. He just wanted to kind of pass by. He just wanted to go down that street and take a peek of what was there. That's all the indication we read about, about him. And yet he passed near her corner of the way to her house. Proverbs 4, verse 14 and 15 says, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. Proverbs 6, 27 and 28. Can a man take fire in his bosom? And his clothes not be burned? Can one walk upon coals and his feet not be burned? Exodus 23 verse 2, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. That's exactly what he did. He failed to remember the danger of flirting with sin. Probably every indication that he wasn't going to do anything. He's just going to go down that street. He's going to kind of take a peek as he went by, you know. He wanted to look at this woman and kind of people down that way. Because the Bible says in this text that she came out of her house and she grabbed him and she kissed him and whispered in his ear. And she caused him to sin. In the springtime, this is March now. If you're like in Tennessee and other places, the high school proms will be getting going and getting up and ready. And often the things that they get into and the dances that are there. And, and we need to be preaching and teaching, warning our children, our grandchildren you can't do that. You can't go there. You're putting yourself in a den of thieves and thinking you're not going to sin. Present this scenario. This young lady, your daughter, or young man, your son. Oh, Dad, everybody's going. This only happens once in a lifetime. Everybody's going to the prom. I will be the laughing stock. I've got to go. I've got to go. I've got to go. Or right, tell them, okay, here's what you do. Go ahead. Go ahead. And when that boy comes over to you and says, well, you want to dance? Nowadays, that girl comes over to that boy and says, you want to dance? Here's what you do. Say, yes, let's get out there on the floor and dance. And get out in the middle of the floor. Now, before you start wiggling, what you need to do is tell your partner, let's bow for a word of prayer and let's pray that our mind will stay pure and we won't think bad thoughts and our hands won't touch and our body won't touch and bump and, and that we'll be decent and in order, we'll be a figure of godliness and holiness. and Just pray. And pray out loud now. You want everybody to hear you in there. You want to lead a prayer now. They'd left you out of that place. Why? Because they know. Young people know. Everybody knows. Dances and drinking and whatever the partying is. It does not go with Bible. Doesn't go with prayer. Doesn't go with devotion to God. It doesn't go with praising His high and holy name. It doesn't go with total opposites. Because you're putting yourself in the midst of the danger just like this man did. Oh, I can go and it won't bother me. Well, that's what he thought too. But it didn't turn out that way. We read in Matthew uh, chapter 26 and verse 14 where we're told to watch 
and pray that you enter not into temptation. You think that's watching and praying that you don't enter into temptation, go down there to the prime, go to that dance hall, that dance club, go down to that beer joint, go out there to the beach, we're all going to strip naked and waller around in the sand. You think that, is, is that a godly thing to do? They know better than that. They know better than that. We are to pray and to abstain from all appearance of evil. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil companionships, the paraphrase that we often say of it, is the very thing that corrupts good morals. We are to have no fellowship with the fruit, unfruitful works of darkness. That's what dancing is. That's what drinking is. That's what every vice and vile thing that goes on in the world is what it is. It's an unfruitful work of darkness. If not, why don't we bring that here into our worship service and have a big hoopla and a big party? I actually heard a man say one time that worship is a party. Can you imagine that? He said worship is a party. There ought to be some on this side of the auditorium singing Amazing Grace, and there needs to be somebody on this side of the auditorium hugging grace. If his idea concept was a party, this is a solemn assembly of devotion and adoration and homage to God, of holiness. It's not about lustfulness and filling every desire of the human flesh. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Psalm 1, I love the whole psalm, but here we read about it. He says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So right, here's this young man. He said, don't walk down that street. He walked anyway. First thing you know, he had to stop. This woman comes out, starts rubbing all over him. The next thing you know, he was sitting down with him. That's the progression of sin. Don't walk that way. Then you won't be tempted to stop and look. Then you won't be tempted to sit down or in the midst of it. Here's a great point made out of Genesis chapter 39. We read in verse 7 where Potiphar's wife had eyes for Joseph. And in verse 10, we read where Joseph refused to be with her. He refused. He knew better. She worked it out on this particular occasion where all the servants, everybody in the house, all going to be gone, nobody here now, but her. And so she summons Joseph to come. He didn't even want to be with her. Great, great example. Don't flirt with sin. Third thing. How do we avoid Temptation, not yielding to temptation. We need to remember that God sees everything we do. All things are present in his sight. Proverbs 7, beginning in verse 18. Come, now here's this woman. She comes out, she grabs a hold of him. She starts telling and whispering in his ear, Come, let us make our fill of love into the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves, for the good man is not at home. He's gone on a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and he will come home with the day appointed, and with her much fair speech, notice this, verse 21, with her much fair speech she caused him to yield, and with her flattering lips she Forced him. What do we learn? God's watching. God sees it. What was this woman's advice? I'm at home by myself. And my husband's not coming back tonight. Now you know how I know that? I know that because he's a businessman. And I, I know how he takes business trips. And he left home this time with a big old bag of money. He's not coming back anytime soon. He won't be here tonight. Therefore, won't you just come in here and spend the night with me, young man? Nobody will know it. Nobody here. Nobody's going to know it. God will know it. 
If nobody else knows it, God knows it. He sees it. If we will remember when we're tempted to sin that nobody's around, not a soul's going to find out about this, God sees it. Have you ever been in a big store? A big store. Sometimes just, just sit back and, and just kind of go over in the corner and, and just watch and observe people. Before long, probably you might see one of them pick something up and kind of look at it. and You know. They're looking to see if anybody's watching. They don't recognize, refuse to acknowledge God's watching. God sees it. We might do something that goes unknown in this world and we live all of our lives. Nobody ever knows it. God knows it. God knows it. We need to remember how to resist temptation is that God has an all-seeing eye. Verse 21, Proverbs 7, with her much fair speech she caused him to yield with her flattering lips she forced him how did she force him with her flattering lips she presented before him a temptation he couldn't resist he fell foot legs hands and all in the middle of it she didn't force him. But yet that's the way the text reads it. He made the choice. One, to go down that street. Two, to stop. And then three, to go in with her. That's what he did. Notice we read again in the text here of Genesis. Get caught up. In Genesis chapter 39 in verse 9. Here's what Joseph said to Potiphar's wife when she embraced him, hugged on him, whispered to him the same situation this young man was facing here in Proverbs 7. Joseph faced in Genesis 39. And yet here's what he said. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God. Pharaoh or the Potiphar wasn't there. The servants weren't there. Nobody was in the house but Potiphar's wife and Joseph. And yet Joseph knew enough scripture. How can we do this thing and sin against God? God's watching. It don't matter what other people see, but it does matter what God sees because He's the all-seeing eye. Uh, Proverbs 15.3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Job 31.4, God sees our ways and He counts our steps. Job 28.24, God sees under the whole heaven. In Job 34.21, There's no darkness where God cannot see. In the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 and 13, All all things are naked under the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And now here's this statement of Joseph. How can we do this thing and sin against God? God is watching. He sees everything, everything we do. Number four, we'll close. We can pick up reading here then in verse 22 of chapter 7. He goeth after her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, as a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it was for his life. Hearken unto me, ye therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. Verse 26. For she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Verse 27. Her house is the way to hell. And going down to the chambers of death. Isn't that a powerful chapter? 
teaching us how to resist the temptation of sin, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. One lesson, final lesson we need to learn out of this is we must remember there is a price to pay. We need to remember the price of sinning. It's the loss of our soul. This young man fell prey to her because he did not observe the price of her sin. The wages of sin, what is it? It's death. Romans 6, 23. Death, spiritual death. Separation from God. Genesis 2, verse 17. Remember how the devil tempted Eve again? And he comes before her and tries to cast doubt in her mind. Did God tell you not to eat of every fruit of the tree? For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the devil added, thou art not going to die. God's hiding something from you. That's what the devil told her. Oh, if you'll eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened. Then you'll know. You'll be like God. That appealed to her. And she yielded to the temptation. And she ate of that fruit. In Isaiah 3 verse 11. We read about. Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him. For the reward of his hands. Shall be given him. 1 Corinthians 6 uh, verse 9 and 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous. Shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's homosexuals. Abusers of themselves with mankind. That's a homosexual. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. Any other thing shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Over in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 21, we find this whole list of sins there mentioned just like these. And then it says this, and anything such like, anything else that remotely fit into those categories. That's what he says, is against God. Well, if we'll remember Galatians 6 and verse 7, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that's what he's going to reap. And we, we remember that there's not only a price to pay for our sin, it may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. But it's going to come. Just because God may delay His punishment for my sin doesn't mean He's forgotten about it. It will come. It'll come at the judgment day, at the last day. I'll end up on the left side, that broad way, the goat's. Where he says, depart from me, accursed to everlasting fire, prepared for this devil and his angels. Again, and here in James 1, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Revelation 21, 8, there's a second death, that eternal separation from God. My soul, your soul will be there. So what have we learned in all of these lessons? Number one, make God's word the rule of your life. Remember there is danger in flirting with sin, seeing how close you can get and still not be affected by it. We need to remember that God sees everything we do. We need to know there's a price to pay and it's the damnation of our souls what it is. Total, eternal separation from God because we yielded to sin. These four great principles, great lessons is what we need to learn and keep in mind that will keep us from sinning if we'll follow them, if we'll do what God says. So tonight, if you've never obeyed the gospel, you can do so if you truly believe that the Lord is the Christ, the Son of God, willing to repent of your sins, confess faith in Christ, that He is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He died for you and He died for all of mankind. You can become a child of God by being immersed into water for the forgiveness of your sins. If anybody here tonight or watching online or sometime in the future watching the recording of this, if you need to study further, need more scriptures and talking about it, then you're welcome to do that. We've got all the time that God will allow us to have to help you save your soul.
It's in your hands. It's in my hand. My soul's in my hands. Your soul's in your hands. But you need to obey the gospel. So you'll be with God one day and hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. If you need to come or come back to the fold, won't you do that as we stand and sing?